<laughs> yeah, everybody have one of the handouts? Uh, hey, Ellen. We are at seven o'clock, so let's start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather around your word tonight. Bless us through it. Help it be something that uh, enriches us, uh, encourages us, builds us up in our relationship with you, and, and gives us an appreciation for the, the work of the ministry that we get to do uh, as we get to share you with others. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions? We are on 1 Timothy 4. Last week we did 1 Timothy 3. Did anyone have anything that came up that you had questions about in the interim? See how well you remember. What did we talk about last time? <laughs> that was the time before that, and it wasn't me. That sounds really bad for someone who wasn't here last week. Um, <laughs> women should be quiet. Is that, that the, one? the passage that we read. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> so that was at the end of two. That was the one that Peter taught. That was the one Peter mm -hmm. taught. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, Peter. yeah, so we did have a bunch of, <laughs> we did, have, and we thank you for that, Peter. Uh, we did have a bunch of discussion about that, and then we got into chapter three, which was. God given, yeah, yep, God given qualifications for the ministry, right? So now into four, um, we'll talk, you know, Paul keeps giving Timothy, this young pastor, some more instructions. So if you don't have a Bible, there are some on the tables. There's a couple here. Looks like ones on that table have been grabbed. Most of you want to hand one over. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> And anyone want to shout out a page number for First Timothy 4? 1806. 1806. 1806. Uh, and let's let's uh, do the first eight verses to start. So Candy, you get to play or pass, read as much as you want. Kick David when you want him to take over, and, and we'll go on down the line. Okay. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come to hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to, bro to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, Rather, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has some value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Okay, thank you. What questions does that bring up? What do you notice? Okay, explain that. Um, forbid some people to marry and forbid certain foods. Okay, so, and and what's the context here? Paul tells Timothy, there are going to be people who have some false teachings, and they are going to make these extra rules. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. It, it's, I was a little bit confused because the, 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 the food was, um, again, an old Jewish mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. But it also talked about deceitful and demonic teachings which is not exact it's not the same it's like something is foreign the other one is close to home so I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit uh when the devil lied to eve um 
he kind of used a little bit of the truth, didn't he? Oh, yeah. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Um, and so so I, I, I guess I think with like, uh, we studied Galatians maybe a year ago, right? Uh, and that was all of the Paul coming, the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul to come at them about the false teaching that was creeping in, saying we have to go stay fulfilling all of the Jewish customs. Mm -hmm. All of those, we got to keep all those Jewish laws like circumcision. Remember, Paul said, you know, why don't you go all the way? And you know, because it's a it's a it's a very damaging thing. Um, and when you do that, you uh uh cause a lot of problems. And so, you know, maybe something similar with I mean, you're right, that does sound like okay, God had told the Old Testament people of Israel, don't eat pork, don't eat shrimp, don't eat, you know, mm -hmm. all of those rules that they had. Um, but then Jesus came and said okay those are fulfilled um they were pointing ahead to when jesus would come and and now they're they're fulfilled uh in church a couple of weeks ago we had the gospel lesson where peter had the vision right or that was the x lesson peter had the vision of the sheet that lowered down uh with all those unclean animals in it god says go ahead kill and eat peter says no i'm never going to do that because you know i keep your rules and God, you know, these things are unclean. And God says, don't call something unclean that I have made clean, that I have made pure. And three times he put, you know, he wanted Peter to understand. And then Peter goes to the Gentile's house and says that, yeah, I get it now. Yeah. Um, that uh, that which was a true teaching for the Old Testament people of Israel. It's a new covenant. Now. It's a new covenant. Right. Now Jesus is here. And so what was true for them is a lie for someone else god has not commanded us to do that you know and so so he you know he talks about <laughs> these things come from hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with the hot iron someone unpack that that image their consciences have been seared as with the hot iron what is he saying you can't get through okay you can't see to okay. I'm thinking about it, that once you get to a certain point, you kind of have to kind of get a reverse not claiming that for yourself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When you think of the, like the the iron, if you imagine the iron on a flesh, I mean, you, you burn that out, you turn the earth and everything, so there's no sensation there anymore. Yeah. Eventually, it doesn't bug you anymore. Eventually, it's it's all crust it up or what you know however you want to uh not not a pleasant thing right but uh um and you think about how the conscience works that way right the first time you do something that's maybe a little questionable um oh boy i shouldn't have done that and oh no and they're gonna get caught and whatever else but but then then you get away with it and well the next time maybe the conscience is bugging you a little bit but not nearly as much as the first time and eventually Oh no, this is just what I do, right? This isn't an issue. Um and you know, Timothy being a pastor mm -hmm. and the warning against the false teachings. People get to the point of just saying stuff because they've said it. And they say it again and again and again. And and it it doesn't strike, it doesn't seem as wrong as it, you know. First time, oh, maybe, I don't know, but you keep saying it and eventually it becomes true, right? And so there's the warning against the, the false teachings, right? Um, making these rules, uh, <clears throat> saying don't do this, but he says everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Um, any questions? What would he be referring to when he says by the word of God in prayer? I mean, I can see praying for something. When he referred to the word of God, what, what does that mean? Okay. Um, so may, let's take, for example, uh, the meat sacrifice to idols. First Corinthians 14, there's that, you know, wrong chapter. Somewhere in First Corinthians, there, there's the discussion of the the food sacrifice to, to idols that, and he says, you know, an idol is nothing. And so there's nothing wrong with the believer going to the market and buying something, you know, because after they would do the sacrifice, they'd 
take it to the market and sell it. Um, and he says, there's nothing wrong for a bleep, I mean, because an idol's nothing. There's nothing behind it. But uh, if him doing that is going to harm someone else, don't do that, right? Um, but if if it's it's not an issue for someone else, if, if you're doing it, walking your Christian life, you know, you're, you're giving thanks to God for it. You're, you're not saying, hey, this is... Um, uh, making a statement of, of, you know, one thing or the other. If you're walking your Christian life, which involves Thanksgiving, word of God and prayer, uh, you're good. Uh, and, you know, so, so how does that all go in word of God, I guess, uh, um, considering all the different aspects of what me doing this thing, what, what the implications are, right? So like Paul saying it, if it's going to bother someone, I'm never going to eat meat again. Um, if it's going to harm someone's faith. But if someone is trying to make a statement and saying you can't, and God says this, and they're damaging people, well, then I'm going to eat meat so that people can see that uh, and, and realize that uh, we got to listen to what God's word said instead of what this false teacher is saying. So, so considering everything that God says as you make a decision about it, that, does that make sense? Okay. What were the prevalent books of the gospel at this point so first timothy written 60, 61 somewhere in there so you would have had the the synoptics matthew mark and luke uh how how uh much access everybody had to them you know for some of these people uh it it may have been what Paul had taught them uh, orally. Uh, they they may not have a copy. You know, it's it's hard to say who and when had the copies of the Gospels. Um, and, you know, were the, was Paul bringing a copy with him on the churches he was starting? And, and I mean, the, the timeline of it might have made that a little bit difficult uh, because, you know, like he said, he was, was not consulting with the other apostles except for the times that we hear of him, you know, being in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean it's impossible, but it may very well be that it's the message of, you know, using the Old Testament, certainly, especially he started in the synagogues, he started with the Jews, um, and, and using the Old Testament and telling them what Jesus had done as far as uh, the gospel or the, you know, the, the rest of the story, the, the fulfillment of those promises. But that's a really good question, and I should do some more reading. So I'm going to give you an I don't know. I gave you kind of my uh, no, that's fine. gut I, thoughts. I, but, I yeah. guess my concern is, you, you, and this has been prevalent throughout, you know, the epistles and, and now, where you have a lot of people walking around mm -hmm. making believe that they're <clears throat> right. teaching Mm -hmm. the gospel right but you know the, yeah. you hear stories about the gospel of judas the gospel of mary magdalene the gospel well of this those one. were not around at this time those were right hundreds but, of years later you hear yeah. about yeah. all this so there are there could have been other sure yeah and you know with all the warnings that paul gives there were other people going around mm -hmm. teaching um and he said some of them just for gain right you know collecting money and and hey i'm i'm gonna tell you something and you know maybe having heard or invented or whatever yeah and another thing is, is many of those same ideas who also had in the uh, greek uh, philosophical tradition had been around for a while mm -hmm. so those ideas were written mixed in with right and, right and you know this uh this famous line and this is things taught by demons but those early church fathers like tertullian definitely thought that some of that was you know yeah. demonic in nature but even though it was the same thing, like the the, the dietary laws and the books regarding chastity and stuff, it was for a different kind of purpose. Right? Yeah, you know the 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 belief that the uh, the body is evil and you got to get to the spiritual realm, and that had a lot, you know, with the the chastity stuff, and so that yeah, and there were people going around kind of pulling from everything and saying, "Hey, here's what you got to listen to. Um, pay me." And Paul says, "No." I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what we got to be talking about. 
this is what it's all about. Um, so the, the first question on discuss says, what will happen as the world draws to a close? And what example of false teaching does Paul mention? People will turn away from people will turn away from the truth. Yep. Yeah. So we'll have deceitful spirits and things that call by demons. Okay. They're following deceiving spirits. Okay. There'll be there'll be yeah. Assumption. Yeah. I mean, so when we see false teaching around, should we be surprised? No. You know, he says the spirit clearly says this. Um List the qualities that Paul gives for a good minister in verses four to seven. Nourished in trust and faith. Turning false teachings and holding what word was. Okay. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And it tells you have nothing to do with the godless myths and the okay. old wives tales. Yep. Train yourself. <laughs> yeah, you've got you got God's word. Let's go with that. Yeah, keep training in that, studying that. Anything else? Yeah, physical training is some value, but godless godliness has value for all things. So you know the uh, the the training in in the word in in godly things. Good. Any other questions, comments on verses one to eight? Okay. Then we'll take nine to 16. I think we're on the Smiths. Take as much as you want and pass around. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance. But to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Ne ne neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely, <laughs> preserving them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your ears. Okay, thank you. Um, what jumped out at you? What questions pop into your head? Tells you what to do until he comes back. Okay. Yeah. This this uh, list of instructions. You know, the, the book says this is now the third time in the letter that Paul's introduced the topic with the words, this is a trustworthy statement, uh, calling attention to something. Daniel? What about the word, because in that translation, the word presbyter, which is all of the word, but it's not coming from the translation. So uh, what other translations do we have around the table for that word? So we've got elders, yeah. Lines Lines elders. What's that? Mine says eldership. Eldership. Uh, and every 84 was body of elders. Um, let me okay. So let's see what verse was that? 14. Oh man. You see that a lot in, in the, the writing the early church fathers. I'm wondering where that came in. Okay. I don't recall seeing that necessarily. In I was thinking my Greek was getting really bad. I was in the wrong chapter. So uh, I'm like, okay. this isn't anything like we what we were <laughs> Which of the, perhaps, of the, yeah, of the, um, the Greek word is presbyteroi. Uh, so presbyterioi. So the 
the uh, the elders. So uh, at the laying on of hands of, of the elders, so kind of like uh, an ordination today, uh, where um, the area pastors come and and the person is is ordained that they make their promises, uh, and then each of the pastors puts their hand on them and speaks a word of encouragement from God's word, and and then they they get up and take on the duties to which they've been called. So uh, it would seem he chapter or chapter three, um, and the overseer would kind of be the pastor. The elders would have been the the local leaders of the the congregation. So at the time that they put their hands, lay their hands on him, and uh, installed him, ordained him, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, to to take that position, um, seemingly young. Uh, the lexicons will say that uh, that term, you know, he says, "Don't look, don't let anyone look down on you for your youth," would be could have been anyone up to 40 years old. Uh, usually uh, someone wouldn't start teaching until 30. And so they were still a rookie, you know, until they had had a few years of, of experience in there. And and Paul says, you got the word, right? Don't let, you know, just because you're, you're young, um, don't let that be a hindrance. Don't let someone uh, say, no, there's no reason to listen to this guy if you're speaking the word. I have a question about uh, verse nine. Okay. Where it says we put our hope in the living God, who's the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. That's making a distinction. Okay. Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. Um, yeah. Kind of a reference to the universal living man a little bit. Or how could you take that exactly? Okay. So let's. This is a great question. This was one that if you didn't bring up, I was going to bring up. So. I'm going to turn it on you because that's how I was going to start with it. So you asked it. So eventually I'll have to answer it. But I want to, what do you guys think? Uh, that sounds a little weird, right? Well, so. how, how, as the savior of all people, when Christ uh, hung on the cross and paid for literally everyone, but those who believe in the ones who are going to end up okay. going to heaven. So, it's like it's paid for, but you they have to take advantage of it. When okay. It's water. Yeah. So we, we've got uh, a couple of uh, theological words that are swimming around in my head mm -hmm. uh, for this. What are what are we talking about here? Okay. So, um, okay. It, I, I realize that's an unfair question. You got to guess what I'm thinking here. Oh, Peter, go ahead. Are you talking about objective and subjective reconciliation? Okay, yeah. I was thinking justification, but reconciliation works too. Yeah, objective and subjective, right? So, so the objective truth is um, God is the savior of all people, right? God sent his son. He made a promise from the day of, of Adam and Eve. He made a promise. I'm going to send one to crush Satan's head and, and rescue you guys. And, and he kept that promise. He sent his son to pay the price, to justify, to declare not guilty all people because all sins are paid for. And then he says, and especially, and let me, that's what I was looking up and I started thinking about something else. Um, uh Savior of all men, malist. Uh, so uh, most of all, above all, especially, particularly, um, he's the savior of all. The benefit is for those who believe. Uh, they're the ones who really get the benefit from it. Everyone gets the benefit that that God is such a loving God that he sent his son to die for them. Um, we get heaven because of it, because of the faith, right? Um that does that answer that in there? But it's up to you to accept what he what he gave you. Okay. So it it's it's each uh the gift is there, right? God is is handing out this this gift, 
And some people say, no, I don't want that. I want to I want to try handling this on my own, right? I'm going to stand before God based on how good I've been or how much I understand or whatever else. If I'm standing before God without that forgiveness that God has given to me and won to me and was handing to me, I'm in trouble, right? So it's, it's those who believe that have the benefit. And now we, we get into, you know, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, why do I believe? Well, because God changed my heart, right? You know, the Bible talks about how by nature we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were hostile to God. We thought his word was foolish. We, uh, um, you know, only evil all the time. Those are the ways God described us by nature. And then uh, the Bible says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And you know, another place is because of him, because of God, that you are in Christ Jesus. Um, so, uh, yeah, God works in our hearts to receive. You know, he changes our hearts so that they're hearts that are receiving, uh, accepting, believing hearts. Um, and I always want to be careful that when the way we phrase that does not give the impression that, well, it's because I'm better than someone else or I was smarter than someone else. It was God's grace, right? God's grace worked on my heart and and caused me to, whatever term you want to use, accept, receive, believe um, that gift that God has given. And so that that subjective justification, um, it becomes mine through faith. And that faith is a gift of God, like Ephesians 2 says, you know, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Um, yeah. That's actually well important. It's a, it's a, it's, I've, had, I've struggled trying to explain that to people. I know what I'm trying to say. I just don't know how to. I'm sorry, that actually sounds like good job. As opposed to normal, Pastor. That would be fun. I know. See, I wasn't thinking anything bad, Chris. Okay. It's Melissa. <laughs> Yeah, you'll learn it <laughs> thank you thank you yes I, I grew gray hair so you wouldn't think i was young and looked down on me for my youth anymore right. yeah. <laughs> so yeah i mean it's it's a uh it's a minefield because there are so many false teachings out there about it and you know you you don't want to say too much and you don't want to say you know you want to say what scripture says right yeah yeah um, and so, yeah, he's the savior of all, especially or um, in the highest level, malasta, those who believe. Um, so, yeah, he saved us all. The ones who believe get the benefit of it. So, yeah, that that objective, subjective justification. You guys familiar with those terms? Uh, objective meaning, you know, it's an objective truth. Subjective, uh, it it becomes mine. Yeah. Good. Anything else in that section that jumped out at you? <laughs> Question number three. Oh, Donna. Oh, sorry. I just saw a hand going over the screen. Um, so uh, what That's is- That's because the... I just got my screen back. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is the heart of the Christian faith? Number three. that God made the sinner's Okay. Yeah. You know, trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And this is what our, our whole work is about, is, is sharing this message. We've put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all, especially those who believe, you know, trust in God, right? That's the heart of the Christian faith. Trust in God. He's your Savior. Um, what does the word, oh, we already talked about number four. Uh, you know, God saved all people. So there's that object of subject of justification. Uh, list the qualities of a good minister from these verses, 11 to 16. <laughs> yeah, to give you a good example in okay. love and spirit and faith and purity. Yep. Set an example for the believers in speech, life, love, faith, purity. Yeah. You've got to teach the core message. Okay. Now remember the trust really saying that, that our, our job is all about. Okay. Age doesn't matter. It's, it's okay. Okay. Doesn't matter how old you are either. Okay. 
Thank you. I've got a birthday coming, so you know. <laughs> um, what else? Okay. Yeah, you know what? Um, God has given each of us unique gifts and says, hey, you use them. Be diligent, right? Um, okay. Yeah, sometimes you, you say something once and people don't listen. Sometimes you show up at a at a house and encourage someone to come back or to come. And you know, yeah, we should. But then it doesn't. And then you show up again. And then you show up again. And again, you know, be diligent. Um, anything else? What does it mean when he says, watch your life and doctrine? Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you hearing that? Yeah. Who, who wants to, who wants make to sure, Make sure you're preaching what the Bible says. Okay, watching your doctrine you're closely. Right. Um, that, okay, this is, this is the truth that we're speaking, not just, this is what Pastor Sharp thinks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Watch your life closely. Actions. Yeah, yeah. Um, persevere, right? The being a, a sinner, making mistakes. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Persevere. Um, now, Veronica, you said that verse ten had a, a funny sounding section. If you do, this is think of verse sixteen. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Mm -hmm. Be careful how you understand that. What's that? You have, you have to be careful how you understand that. Careful how you understand it. What did you say, Veronica? That's, a bit odd. that's that's that, that kind of catches you too, right? What is he saying? Hold fast to your hold fast to the gospel. Okay. What you believe, so that when you make sure you're holding fast to what you have, so your hearers will see that manifest in you. Okay. And Corinne, what were you saying? Yeah, to me, it sounds like you should be mindful with how you teach within the sanctuary, how you teach your congregation the truth of the Lord, that you know you're sounding accurate to God's word, and that you're giving the proper example of the law for you. Okay. Yep, agreed in all of that. There's another step to it. It's leading by example, basically. Okay. It's, you know, you, 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 you follow the doctrine closely. And you will encourage others to do so as well. They'll see how to do it and that it can be done. Okay. And I agree with what all you are saying, but well, what strikes me is the saving yeah. word, yes. right? Yes. So someone explain that. Deadly. Failure is deadly. Yeah. Okay. Failure means that okay. you not only are leading someone up <laughs> yourself astray, but you're lead, you're leading others astray as well. You can damage someone else's salvation by by misusing, but but can I save anyone? No, but if you are doing those things, it would lead you naturally into the path of salvation. Okay. So God's word leads to salvation. We'll save you from death. This is one of those really good agree or disagree questions. Agree or disagree, the pastor can save people. You're just an instrument. Okay, but Paul tells Timothy, you will save yourself and your hearers. Paul, remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I'll become all things to all men so that all possible means I might save some. Did Paul save anyone? So I save like someone that. through the gospel. Okay, I like save that. Someone, that. Yeah, save someone through the gospel, mm -hmm. not that you have the saving power Christ Jesus has. You have that by leading them to the cross. Okay, Alex? Uh, God works through people. Okay. Yeah. So the theologians talk about these different causes of salvation. And, and this didn't jump out at me when I was studying it. So I didn't go back and look at all of these. Otherwise, I definitely would have. But I'm going to do my best to try to recall them here. So, and I, I'm going to, I might mix up the names a little bit, but I I know the, the content behind it. So start at the, what is the root cause of our salvation grace okay grace right um he the the uh, uh 
the re redemptive cause of our salvation would be Christ dying. Christ dying, right? He paid the price mm -hmm. with his suffering and death. So the redemptive cause of our salvation is Jesus dying on the cross for us. The the root cause is the grace of God, right? God said, mm -hmm. I want you to be mine. And so I'm going to send my son. And Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. By grace, he says, I'm going to do what it takes to save these people. So you've got the, the root cause. And that's not the right, that's not the theological term for it. But you know what I mean? The root cause is the is the grace of God. The redemptive cause is the, uh, um, the blood of Jesus, right? The uh, I'm trying to think of the word for for the next one. I got the next. I got the fourth word, but the uh, um, you're basically talking about the uh, Aristotelian four levels of causes. Okay. The end. The end result is the last one. Yep. The first one is the the, the root, like you said. Yep. And there's the the. Um, so now the, the means cause, the uh, the. Uh, Efficient cause, material cause, final cause, like the end of the person. So, so the, the, yeah, it, it's along those lines. Um, the the means of it. So, how does that salvation become ours? Um, Paul Lord. says, "I am not ashamed of the gospel because gospel. it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes." Um, you know, Paul writes, "And this baptism now saves you also." Right, so the means of grace uh, are the whatever the term is, the the efficient the efficient, whatever, cause. efficient cause of salvation. Those are the things that give it to us, and then they'll also talk about the ministerial cause. God could have, you know, on, on Christmas He sent the angels, right? Hey, Savior is born. They're bringing the good news. Shepherds are like, wow, that's awesome, causing that that faith by giving the word. The, the angels on Christmas Eve were the ministerial cause for their faith, whereas today God uses us. And he even uses that word save for Timothy, for Paul, for, for believers as we bring the power. But we have to understand that the only way that you can say that you might save some is because you are bringing the power of God. Right, you are bringing the word, the sacraments, um, and and they have power because Jesus did what He did, and Jesus did what He did because God loves us. So it all goes back to you know because He loves me, right? Because God loved us. But is that got... like, is that like the the function of the triune, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit, He said, if you you are not, you would you would not know unless the Holy Spirit guided you. So is that is that what that is that what you're saying as well? Uh, I wasn't saying that, but that's a, a neat observation, right? The the Father's grace, um, and of course, when we try to divide up the work of the Trinity, we're just not going to do it, it because our mind can't comprehend Him. But as God describes His work, He's some. I mean, you do see those categories, right? So the the the. Uh, Cause God's grace that says, I, I love you, and so I'm going to do all of this for you. Um, we think of the Father, right? And the Son, the one who paid the price, and the Spirit, the one who works with the Word. And then how amazing is it that God says, I'm going to put that Word, and the Holy Spirit's going to work through you. I mean, that's just, wow, our God is good, <laughs> right? Um, Isn't there also a verse about... Um... The wife will save the unbelieving husband, the husband will save mm -hmm. the unbelieving wife. Yep. In First Corinthians 7, yeah, that uh, uh, when he was talking about if you find yourself married to an unbeliever, he says, well, don't get a divorce, don't don't separate, because who knows, God could use that. Um, and yeah, it's not that by being a good enough Christian, the wife, you know, that, that work saves the husband, but by being that Christian, the husband sees that and the spirit works through the wife sharing the word or the wife living the word um and and the husband saying okay there might be something here and eventually he comes to hear the word and then god works through that word and yeah exactly so yeah this is one of those times where you can read through it and first glance you might not even notice it and then second time you're like oh wait 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 a second did he just say that you will save um but yeah he did
And that, I mean, that's, again, just highlighting God's grace that he uses a kid like Timothy, right? The young one, um, that he uses a, a, a murderer like Paul, um, that he uses us um, in this work of salvation, which is mind-blowing. Yeah, awesome. Good catch. I'm glad someone brought that up. Um, number six, how can a congregation help its pastor devote himself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching? So that, you know, in verse 13, he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching, and teaching. How does a congregation help the pastor do that? Okay. Praying, lifting up, excellent. They can also insist upon it, right? What's that? They can insist upon it. Okay. Yeah. What does that look like? Well, it means, you know, preaching the word and not uh, doing like that self improvement seminar. Okay. I mean, not that that's not a good thing, but you know, that's something that you can come from your home. Okay. Self improvement is kind of thing the word of God. Yeah. yeah. So letting them know what they're looking for. We want you to preach the word. Yeah. Okay. Although I did just see the Chris Farley uh, band, <laughs> band down by the river. The band down by the river. Yeah. On a <laughs> couple of days ago. Big <laughs> <laughs> um, What else? What else does it look like? By signing up on the sign-in sheets. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, signing up on the sign-in sheets. What does that do? How does that help the pastor devote himself to the public reading? Gives him time to do, to read versus being out there doing the things that the church, okay. also the other things the church needs to do. Okay. Attend Bible study. There you go. When you guys ask questions like this, mm -hmm. That makes me be more prepared next time because I'm like, okay, what are they going to ask as I read through this? <laughs> okay, what possible rabbit holes could we be going down? And I want to study that so that I'm ready to answer those questions. I do that too when I've got a teacher. Yeah. I don't have the knowledge you do. <laughs> so, We're all growing <laughs> every day, right? And, and yep. yeah. Anything else? How can a congregation help its pastor? Someone was saying something over here. Was that you, Melissa? Um, also, an obligated to compare what our pastor says to the Bible and okay. lovingly, you know, point out discrepancies if that okay. happens. And... Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Um, and feed him. Um, you get fed. <laughs> feed you. Feed me, yeah. Pretty good. Is. <laughs> Feeding is good. Feeding the food is always good. Yeah, I was. I wasn't sure if you were talking about spiritually no, feeding. No. Or, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. There you go. <laughs> you want to say something, Chris? Define the difference between preaching and teaching, <clears throat> because they're in the gifts. It says some to be preachers, some to be teachers. Mm -hmm. Here it tells Timothy do both. Yep. And not long ago, I had a conversation with someone who was differentiated between the people he hears. Or sees on the radio or on TV as well. That's a teacher versus that's preaching. Okay. Usually the preachers are the ones that make all the noise and jump up and down and scream and holler and that kind of stuff. And the other ones are more subdued and just. He so, consider you a teacher, not a preacher, because of the way you present okay. your sermon. So. More civilized. <laughs> so, and then I don't think that that's necessarily the distinction that you know. I don't get the impression that. Paul was jumping up and down when he was preaching. He he yeah. he preached all night in where was Eutychus? Where did Eutychus fall out the window? Ephesus. Um, Bible trivia. Mm -hmm. So he preached all night and people were falling asleep on him. I don't think he was jumping up and down, right? You know, uh, I, so uh -huh. I don't think it's the style of presentation so much, but uh, teaching, um, especially. At the time of Paul, the understanding was it's done with questions. It's done digging into something. It's there's there's feedback. There's response. So this would be teaching. Um, if, if I, you know, and there are some teachers uh -huh. who 
teach with kind of a preaching style, right? Uh, just yeah. lecture, right? I was going to say, um, more like a lecturer, right, right. Than right. just listening mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. taking notes and stuff that you're not interacting with. Yeah, and usually preaching is, is uh, um, you see it in the context of public worship and teaching is everything else. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, Jesus would speak out uh, to uh, different people like with the, uh, the Beatitudes or he might speak parables to different people but then he had to come back because the disciples didn't understand and he had to teach them what he was yeah. talking he had to explain those parables to them so he was doing the same thing preaching and teaching yeah yeah, and I, I don't I mean, there's not always a lot of distinction between the two. Um, you know, the there are some who would punctuate. You were talking about how he gave some to be pastors, some to be teachers. There are many who would punctuate that as he gave some to be pastor teachers. Okay. Like hyphen. Uh, the, the grammar can also be taken that way. So there doesn't have to be a huge distinction. And Gaynell brought up a good point. Uh, think of how many times it said Jesus was teaching. So Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went up on the mountain and he began to teach his disciples, but you don't hear any questions and answers going on there. Um, he's, he's just sharing the, this truth. Um, some people make the distinction that teaching is more digging in and learning something new mm -hmm. and preaching is proclaiming what you already know and need to hear again. Um, Okay. Now, depending where you are in your faith life, that preaching that for someone else is something I've already heard may be teaching for, for me. So I, I don't think we can make a clean, this is preaching, this is teaching break. But good. I don't know where the question, good. Why it even matters. I don't think it does. But it, it just there are distinctions. Just like, yeah. um, not long ago, I heard one say, well, they can tell if the person is anointed when they walk up on the stage, if they're okay. anointed by God. And if they what are you looking at and where are you determining that from? But that's how they determine whether or not they're going to listen to the person. Okay. You know, kind of thing. So there's a lot of different stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. We have like a the anointing shirt. Yeah. yeah. So a, a soup or a pot of everything out there right now that's. And you go back to the, the spirit clearly says that in the later times, some will oh, yeah. abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things, you know. Um, yeah. So. It, and then as people are trying to figure out, okay, what's right, what's wrong? And, you know, yeah. And there's always the, now it's this, this hot take thing, right? I got to say something that's controversial to get people talking about it. And, you know, you see some of these things, a couple people have sent me um, some things that uh, I'm not, I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole here, but so I'll just say some things that have been said recently by famous preachers mm -hmm. and uh um some of the things they say yeah they're true uh and the, the way they come at it sometimes seems like okay you're you're missing something here that has a lot to, do with that, yeah. to bring it up but, yeah. but it, it, i mean it becomes a, an issue of personality as, mm -hmm. as opposed to anything else i mean what are they doing they're trying to become like more important than the message itself mm -hmm. right i mean it it it, it, it kind of it kind of puts them at a higher level than what the real word is, what the real truth is. Yeah. And or at least more important than the next guy down the street with their computer. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, and, yeah, and that's that's the thing. It, let's do everything we can so that the truth of the word gets out there. Um, yeah. And it's not a competition. It's a it's a calling to to be faithful so that you. Persevere in, in doctrine so that you save yourself and your hearers. Yeah. Good. Is it is it important to call out people who are, you know, spreading the, the incorrect okay. things all the time? So wasn't this a question like three weeks ago? Um, should the pastor preach polemical sermons talking about these bad people that are teaching false things? What do you think? Yeah, to a point. Depends on how bad it is. What's the motivation? Okay. Yeah. Like all of them. Yeah. If it, if it's something that people are listening to, um, and and are buying into, then then yes, we got I got to call that out. Um, 
if it's I don't think it's, things, if it's if confusing it... things. Yep. I, I don't think it's my job to be watching everybody else's sermon so that I can say, hey, this guy said this and this is wrong. Um, you know, let's let's there's that old, I don't know if it's true or not. I it sounds true. I've heard it enough times, so maybe it is. So that's the way I I uh differentiate between when I'm saying something that's in scripture and you know, but uh but the concept I like that uh those who work on uh, identifying fraud or counterfeit money mm -hmm. they don't really do a lot of thing you know studying the counterfeits right they just learn what it should look like what the original looks like so well that you can spot a counterfeit real easily and and that's my goal in teaching the truth and saying okay here's god's word learn what god's word says so well so that when you hear something else, that radar jumps. And like, eh, I don't think that's quite right. Which sometimes even happens here. We just read a passage. Mm -hmm. Save yourself. And you, that doesn't sound right because I know God's word says it's only through Jesus that I'm saved, right? Um, but then, okay, how does God explain this? Let's dig into the word. Let, let, you know, so, so yeah, have that radar up, ready to hear um, and compare it to God's word. I was I was a hand up online. I was looking over here in the corner of my eye. Was someone trying to say something? No. Okay. All right. Um, good. Any other questions, comments on this one? All right. Give me your one sentence. I'll give you two minutes to write your one sentence summary of what First Timothy four is about. So. You take two minutes, write a sentence, and I will ask three people to read them after your two minutes. So one sentence summary of what was in this chapter. Or even just what struck you. What was what did you take out of it? All right, who will share? Yeah, words and truth back me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't even need a sentence, one word, the truth, the truth. right? That's beautiful. Who else? Gird yourself up and never forget why you're here. Gird yourself up and never forget why you're here. I like it. Yeah. Corinne? Discerning false teachers are walking in faith in the Lord God. Okay, discerning false teachers and walking in faith in the Lord's laws. The Lord's laws. All right. Eat bacon. <laughs> Nick always finds interesting things in the text. Yep. <laughs> bacon is good. Anyone online? I didn't give anyone online a chance to, to read. <laughs> uh, I have a uh, end times are here. Train yourself in God's word. Okay, Take so bringing in that that first verse, the end times are here. Train yourself in God's word. Excellent. Actually, at the bottom of the page, a great sentence. A faithful Christian pastor tends to his spiritual needs and the needs of those entrusted to him. Okay, I my my sentence was Paul encourages the young minister to be bold with the truth and stay in the word in order to serve. Um, so good. 
So we've got five minutes left. Any questions? I don't think it paid to start the next chapter. So uh, any questions or comments? And then I'll also take prayer requests. So we'll close with a, a prayer for some people. Um, I need prayer for my brother. He was scheduled for surgery, but his iron levels were really low and he couldn't have his surgery. So okay. I'm praying uh, to strengthen him. Okay. His name is Jerry. Okay. Martha. Any others? Okay. Okay. All right, then let's pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us your word and and faith to believe it. Thank you for the the core of that message that Jesus is our Savior, um, and and for the thrill that that means we get to go to heaven. And especially we thank you for the privilege that you use us to bring that message to others, to save others through the work that, that you have accomplished. Um, bless us as we continue growing in your word that we are, are girded up against all the, the false teachings out there. And tonight we ask that you be with uh, Gaynell's brother, Jerry. Um, if it's your will, allow those iron levels to improve so that he can have his surgery and, and allow everything to go well through that. Be with uh, Ellen's friend Andy and the whole family as he is in hospice. Uh, give them your comfort and peace from your promises. Uh, be with Sandy's friend Martha, who is mourning the loss of her husband. Uh, help her to, to see your love. Help her to, to realize that you are with her to, um, to take care of her through this. And be with Gustavo's mom uh, as her health is is fading, uh, is waning. Bless uh, bless her that she may recover. Bless um, all of these people that they may find in you peace. Uh, and if it's your will, healing as well. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. That was fun. Next week, First Timothy 5. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.